Thank you for joining us and welcome to the webinar. My name is Anna Rosenbaum and I'm Public Affairs Manager for the National Association of Regional Councils. If you should have any technical questions during the webinar, please email my colleague Cameron Erbelsheimer directly. His information is on the welcome screen you see in front of you. He will also be managing the questions section that you see at the bottom of your screen. Please note that there are three handouts that are also available right there on the right side of your screen. We also have a short five minute video to play later in the presentation that you'll need to use your computer speakers for. With that, today I'm pleased to be joined by several experts in the field of green infrastructure and resiliency. First, we will hear from David Rouse, Managing Director of Research and Advisory Services for the American Planning Association, or APA, here in Washington, DC. In this capacity, David leads APA's applied research programs, including the Planning Advisory Service and the three national centers for planning, green communities, hazards planning, and planning and community health. David is a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners and a registered landscape architect with over 30 years of experience in community planning and design. Next, we will hear from Travis Miller, Regional Planning Manager for the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Regional Council of Governments the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Greater Cincinnati Region. Travis manages various agency programs and leads regional environmental planning efforts. He is a landscape architect with a Master of Community Planning from the University of Cincinnati and a Bachelor's of Science in Landscape Architecture from The Ohio State University. Travis also serves as an adjunct instructor for the University of Cincinnati School of Planning, teaching courses on transportation and energy planning. Travis will provide you with the background on the partnerships and funding that made the treesandstormwater.org website possible. He'll also introduce you to the website's document folder. Finally, we will have Jenny Gulick, Senior Consulting Urban Forester for the Davie Resource Group. Jenny is responsible for assisting clients to develop and implement urban forestry, park management, and tree preservation projects. She has broad experience in developing urban forest management and master plans, storm response and recovery plans, and expertise in municipal budgeting, staff management, and contract administration. She's an International Society of Arboriculture Certified Arborist and Municipal Specialist, and a certified forester through the Society of American Foresters. Jenny is also a past president of the Ohio Chapter of ISA, president of the Greater Cincinnati Branch of the Professional Grounds Management Society, and former chair of the Facility and Grounds Technical Committee for the American Public Works Association. Now, there will be time for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, please type it into the question box on your control panel. A video recording of the presentation and materials will be available following the webinar. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, David. Uh, thank you, Anna. <clears throat> Again, my name is David Rouse. I'm the Research Director for the American Planning Association. And on behalf of APA, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this webinar. And we're, we're very excited to be hosting this uh, with the National, uh, host, host this webinar on behalf of the National Association of Regional Council and its partners. So just quickly, just, here we go quickly advancing the slide here. What, what we're going to cover, and this is recapping what Anna just said, I'm going to start by giving an introduction to uh, the topic of trees and green infrastructure and some of APA's work in this area, just really an overview. Then Travis is going to get into the website itself and the tool, and uh, he's going to show a video as part of that. And finally, Jenny will uh, uh, talk about real life applications projects uh, incorporating trees in the stormwater management. And as Anna said, we're going to leave some time for a question and answer. So think about questions as we as we go through it, and we'll answer them at the end. Uh, just uh, Anna mentioned the uh, APA, our applied research uh, programs in the three national centers for planning. Uh, this is where we get grants and we do sponsored uh, research through the three national centers for planning. And our mission is to identify, evaluate, develop, and disseminate best practices that address critical issues for planning. And certainly, I think that the intersection of trees and stormwater is one of these, uh, it is a critical issue. It's becoming more and more apparent as we look at some of the uh, recent uh, developments around the, the natural disasters of this fall. And it's also a topic that 
cuts across the three centers that, that through which we co conduct this uh, this re uh, this research: the Green Community Center, the Hazards Planning Center, and also Planning and Community Health. There are benefits, co-benefits associated with health that I'll get to, into in a moment. So let me start by talking about green infrastructure, because I do believe it provides a, a, a useful frame for thinking about the roles of trees and stormwater management. And what I always like to say is that trees are the largest structural component of green infrastructure. So there are two de definitions of green infrastructure that are in common use. The first or the older definition refers to a network of open space, parks, greenways, natural areas, et cetera, at the scale of a city or metropolitan region. More recently, uh, the, the more recent second definition refers to stormwater management practices that use vegetation, soil, and permeable surfaces to absorb runoff close to where it's generated. And uh, the focus of the, of the tool that you'll be learning about today uh, is probably more about that second, um, that second definition, green stormwater infrastructure, but I would also argue that there's really no clear distinction, there's a continuum between these two uh, uh, definitions, and that the role of trees in stormwater management operates across scales from region and city to the neighborhood and site. And these definitions, the first definition is actually taken from a book by Mark Benedict and Edward McMahon called Green Infrastructure, Linking Landscapes and Communities, very good book if folks are not familiar with it. And the second is the EPA uh, definition. So let's look at some examples of green infrastructure across geographic scales from the region, and as I said, to the city, district, neighborhood, and site. Uh, so this slide shows examples of uh, green infrastructure at the regional and city scale. And as I go through them rather quickly, but think about, note the trees and think about the role that trees play at each scale. For example, an example at the regional scale, how preserving and restoring forest cover uh, can reduce runoff and flooding in downstream urban areas. Uh, and this came up in the context of uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, where a lot of the natural drainage areas had been, uh, uh, had been paved over with development. And that received quite a bit of national attention, actually, in, in news coverage. That is a contributing factor. Uh, moving to the neighborhood and site scale, uh, show some examples. I think uh, the top two examples are actually from the city of Philadelphia. Uh, so there, so the, the, the top image is a constructed wetland in the Philadelphia Park, part of their green infrastructure program to reduce runoff, combined sanitary sewer uh, overflow. The second is a green, uh, a green street. And the bottom, actually I put this image in because I think it's pretty cool, but what it is is a green wall on a museum and terrace. And it's, it's an example of how, how green infrastructure can be integrated into the built environment. So thinking about green infrastructure, uh, in addition to physical landscape con uh, connections, thinking about green infrastructure as a continuum, what connect con connects it across scales are the multiple benefits it provides for ecosystems and people, or what are commonly called co-benefits. So, uh, you know, I like to, in thinking about green in infrastructure, organize these benefits around the triple bottom line of sustainability, environmental, economic, and social equity. And I'm going to go through these quickly in the next three slides. And, and I encourage you to think about these as we go through the webinar, how these relate to streams and stormwater management, because there are additional benefits that can be provided by, uh, uh, for communities by taking this approach. Uh, so the first, uh, first uh, of, uh, of these slides shows the environmental uh, co-benefits. This is perhaps where green infrastructure is best known for its benefits, such as absorbing stormwater, reducing runoff, flooding, and erosion, the central focus of the webinar, but also improving air and water quality, moderating climate, and reducing the urban heat island effect, plays a real role in maintaining natural ecosystems and, and native habitat, and thinking about climate change, it can mitigate, it, it, it lessens energy co consumption, sequesters carbon. So there are a lot of environmental benefits that are provided by green infrastructure. And again, trees are central to those benefits that are provided. On the economic side, um, so the, some benefits are listed here. And by the way, there's been a lot of research actually to document these benefits. So there have been studies, for example, that have shown that trees stimulate sales in retail districts. There's more retail activity when there are trees present. More than one study has demonstrated that. Uh, from a social equity perspective, 
uh, green infrastructure can be a source of jobs in poor and underserved communities, and not just in construction and installation, but also in maintenance. People often ask about maintenance and the cost of maintenance, and it's not actually enormous, and it, but it also, uh, as opposed to gray infrastructure, pr uh, produces jobs on an ongoing basis. So it's, it, pro it provides benefits from that standpoint. So some of the other economic benefits you can see are increased property values, attracting visitors, residents, businesses, and reducing gray infrastructure and other associated costs as well. In terms of social equity, uh, this slide shows examples of some of those social benefits of green infrastructure, uh, which are particularly important, and this is really where equity comes in, for poor and minority communities, because there's been a lot of research that shows that such communities have less access to trees, parks, and other uh, green resources than other more affluent populations. And there's a lot of work and a lot of studies out there that have documented the benefits of trees and green infrastructure for physical and mental health, which is one of the key benefits that, that's provided. And again, the lack of access uh, to trees and green sp space is one factor. There are many, many others, but in, uh, it is a factor in the stark difference in health outcomes, lower, le lower life expectancies, uh, more morbi morbidity, disease rates, uh, between lower income and higher income neighborhoods. Now, I'm going to conclude just in a minute because we want to move on to the, to the website and the tool itself, but uh, just uh, want to end by pointing out that much work is being done to quantify the monetary values of these benefits. Uh, for example, through the iTree suite of software tools developed by the U.S. Forest Service. If you're not familiar with this tool, I'd, I'd encourage you to check this out at www.itreetools.org. Just uh, Google iTree, you'll, iTree, you'll find it. But Forest Service is a good partner of APA and supported the work that you see here. And finally, let me end by uh, showing you at the top of the screen here um, a couple of resources, just pointing your attention to a couple of resources that APA has produced on this topic. The top one, with the support of the Forest Service, is Planning the Urban Forest. Uh, it's a PAS report. and the uh, Bottom one is Green Infrastructure and Landscape Approach, which is another PAS report that I co-wrote with uh, Ignacio Bunster, and will be pu published in 2013. And if you are an APA member, now through your membership, you have free access to these and many other PAS reports, uh, uh, PAS reports uh, dating back 10 years or so to, to, to digital access. So with that, that concludes my presentation. That's my uh, contact information at the bottom if, you, if you'd like to give me an uh, email me and uh, I'll turn you back over to Anna. Thank you, David. Now I'll turn it over to Travis. Great. Thanks, Anna. Slides pulled up here. Uh, I'm just really pleased to be here today to be able to share with the audience a uh, brand new tool that's available to them focusing on trees as a component of stormwater management systems. And just by way of introduction, uh, OKI is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Greater Cincinnati Tri-State Region. A region consists of just under 200 local government jurisdictions ranging from urban to suburban to rural communities. We work to provide resources and planning tools for for planning, regional planning for all of these, uh, these communities. As our agency continually works in partnership with our jurisdictions to address regional planning issues, stormwater management seems to be more and more a central focus. Like most, if not all other regions across the country, we are faced with the need to reinvest in old infrastructure systems. As we plan for this reinvestment, green infrastructure solutions are at the forefront of consideration, but these solutions must be practical and they must be reliable as we invest in systems that need to last for generations. Our region maintains a strategic regional policy plan that we've branded, How Do We Grow From Here? This plan helps us have a comprehensive approach to infrastructure system planning. Our region's trees and tree canopy is recognized by this plan as an asset with many benefits, uh, including stormwater benefits. We began doing our own research on how trees can assist in stormwater management a few years ago to see what information was available, and there's a lot. We determined that there was a need to get this information to the decision makers in our communities. The evidence is clear that trees are a viable stormwater management strategy. Based on over a decade of 
academic research and community application. Trees reduce the peak flow of stormwater runoff from urbanized area. And trees also filter out pollutants and sent sediment before the runoff enters streams. With support from the U.S. Forest Service, OKI team with national partners listed here to develop this guide, designed for local decision makers. Jenny Gulick, Davy Resource Group, who you'll hear from in a moment, provided expertise to ensure the guide including practical information applicable to any type and size community. Davy provided case study examples you'll be able to explore in the guide applicable to your own situation. Larry Wiseman, Centerline Strategy, founding president and former CEO of the American Forest Foundation, worked to ensure that all the information contained in this guide is easily accessible to you and in a way that quickly gets you to the resources that are most helpful to your situation. Anna and Cameron with the National Association of Regional Councils help to engage their members and regions across the country to ensure the guide is applicable nationally. NARC also assisted with website design and will maintain the guide, ensuring access to anyone interested in the resource in the future. In addition, the guide was developed with input and guidance from experts across the country. We used a, a national advisory committee in tandem with the regional project advisory committee. The regional committee focused on practical solutions for local governments, while the national committee served to ensure that the tool would be nationally applicable. The resources of the guide were vetted through focus group consultations with community engineers, urban foresters, and stormwater managers. To engage with so many people in so many places, we employed technology using webcasts and online surveys, in addition to in-person workshops to get input throughout the development of the resource. The Arbor Day Foundation allowed us time to engage attendees at their Partners in Community Forestry National Conference last fall in Indianapolis to share preliminary versions of this tool and get input on how to maximize its value to all users. The tool and its resources provide evidence that integrating trees into stormwater management works. Although the focus is on stormwater benefits, this guy doesn't ignore all the other benefits trees provide a community, and it devotes special attention to resources demonstrating the multiple levels of investment returns. Experts told us that case studies are really only valuable if they are similar to to their situation. So this tool features case studies in all climatic regions of the country and in all community types. In a moment, we'll delve into what's maybe the most unique part of the guide, the ability to customize all the information most relevant to you and organize it in a report specific to your community. But before we jump into that, uh, I'd like to share uh, the short video that highlights the features of the guide and walks you through that. Okay, I um, hope you enjoyed that and I hope you do come back often and use the resource. Um, I want to share with you just a little more detail on the document builder. Again, uh, this feature is is unique. This was custom designed for uh, for our tool for um, uh, treesandstormwater.org. Uh, and here are three reasons that we think building a document customized to your community is beneficial. Uh, and we've designed this this feature to to uh, to provide this to you, hoping that, that you agree. Uh, there are two audiences for this feature. The first audience is you. Whether you're a community planner, a park planner, an arborist, or public works executive, the document builder will help you explore how well your community uses trees, not just green infrastructure, but green infrastructure including trees to manage stormwater and deliver the full range of benefits trees deliver, from public health to energy conservation to economic development. The second audience are those folks whose buy-in is necessary to make an aggressive urban forestry program part of stormwater management on public land like parks and private land as it develops. You'll be able to compile a document which can persuade and hopefully convince them to join in. I should note uh, that our, our survey and focus group research work uh, affirms that aligning municipal part departments is the biggest challenge in promoting more and better urban forestry. Uh, and our hope is that this tool can can help uh, in those internal con conversations. One of the benefits of using the document builder is that you can produce, literally, a persuasive document accessible to your colleagues, other departments, and to policymakers. To set up your document, you'll respond to a series of questions. Uh, there are approximately 40 queries. Uh, almost all of them are multiple choice. 
you'll respond to each accordingly. Uh, in in pretest, users reported completion took uh, approximately 20 minutes. Note that most of the queries are not department or function specific, so reaching out to other departments and doing some level of legwork will be required for most folks uh, as um, as the document is built. Uh, but this site, uh, as you saw, allows you to uh, to set up a profile, uh, save your work, and and come back to it as needed. So this is what a document page might look like. Sections of it uh, explore urban forestry in your community, from assessment and planning to policies, ordinances and protocols, to maintenance and risk management. The intent is to help you create a document that can both inform and persuade. Because urban forestry and all its forms is a team effort, and each community has to recruit its own players. iTree provides graphic evidence and, and value um, the value that your trees can deliver in a community or any segment of it. And this, this tool, again, pulls that data and those graphics in. Once completed and downloaded, sections can be rearranged in, in the document. The document can be edited for specific audiences uh, and customized as you deem appropriate. So now, uh, after sharing uh, a little deeper dive on the document builder, uh, I want to turn things over to Jenny uh, to talk more about the details and the information and the case studies that uh, you'll be able to find in the report. All right, thanks. Travis, this is great. I'm excited. I'm still excited. I've been involved in this project since the beginning, and um, I'm still excited about it. I think it's a great tool, and I, I hope um, we've piqued your interest. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is kind of show you some of the real-world projects that have incorporated trees into their stormwater solutions. And then what I want to do is show you some ways that you could do the same thing without even lifting a shovel. Um, people need to understand that you don't have to plant trees to get the stormwater benefits trees provide. So, um, why don't, why is not, oh, there we go. Um, you know what they say. They say you can't fight Mother Nature, and it's uh, very true. And nothing is more natural, excuse me, than trees. And if we recognize that fact, what we can do end up um, doing is harnessing the power that they have to mitigate much of our stormwater issues and improve our communities in many other ways, as we're, we've been hearing. All you got to do, though, is to look around and you see how Mother Nature has been designing stormwater management systems all along, and you get the idea pretty quick of what we need to do in our communities. You may know, you may all know this already, but I just want to give you a quick review of how trees impact stormwater. Um, trees and forests improve storm, uh, stream quality and watershed health primarily by decreasing the amount of stormwater runoff and pollutants that reach our local waterways. Trees and forests reduce stormwater runoff by capturing and storing rainfall in the canopy and releasing it into the atmosphere through evapotranspiration. In addition, Tree roots and leaf litter create soil conditions that promote an inf uh, infiltration of rainwater into the soil. And this helps replenish our groundwater supply and maintain stream flow during dry periods. So every part of a tree um, is kind of like a, a little stormwater uh, facility. And the presence of trees um, also helps slow down and temporarily store runoff, which further promotes infiltration and decreases flooding and erosion downstream. Trees and forests reduce pollutants, meaning they increase the water quality, by taking up nutrients and other uh, pollutants from soils and water through their roots. And then they transform these pollutants into actually less harmful substances. In general, trees are probably most effective at reducing runoff from the smaller, more frequent storms, but we all have those and have to deal with them. And then in addition to these stormwater benefits, Trees provide a host of other benefits for our communities, um, as you've heard, and I will go into a little more detail later. So in our urban centers and our urbanizing suburbs, as we continue to alter the natural landscape, we're quickly losing the stormwater services trees provide us naturally. This graphic shows the progression and the scale of increased impervious surfaces and the increased runoff. So I guess my point is um, we've met the enemy and it is us. The good news though is that we can still reap the stormwater mitigation benefits 
and get a whole bunch of other benefits of trees if we just plan for it. And so this guide that we've created is a one-stop shop for planners who want to explore or start using trees to complement your community's goals. If you need inspiration or, and or justification to even consider incorporating trees into your comp plans, et cetera, the resource section of the guide should have everything you need, from scientific studies to case studies that have put the science to work in very practical ways. So I'm going to walk that uh, walk you through that briefly, and then point out some highlights. So on the website, as you previously heard and saw, um, this is where the resource library is, and you can access it at any time. You don't have to be building a document. You can just go into the uh, guide and go right directly to the resource library. And it is chock full of about 300 resources. And those have been organized by category and type for your convenience. And as Travis said, you can even filter it through your climactic region of the country wherever you are. So for instance, you can find all case studies and BMPs and tools for trees and stormwater in the library. You can also browse the project design and co-benefits section. And probably of particular interest uh, to you all um, are in the things in the public policies and planning resources section. So here's where you'll find existing BMPs, manuals, ordinances, and plans. And we put all these resources in there so that, you know, hopefully you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can uh, take some good ideas from what other people have done. So now I want to highlight some of the research that's been recently completed on quantifying and typifying the tree benefits and some of the case studies that can be found in the resource library. As David mentioned and Travis has mentioned, there are lots of co-benefits of trees and I'm going to expand on some of those. So there is tons of research out there and in the resource um, library about how trees support better public health, which I know is a big planning issue for American communities. So we all know poor air and water quality and heat stressed environments and poor diet, coupled with low activity levels create public health problems. And science has proven though that trees can mitigate those um, urban problems. I mean, quite simply, trees filter the air we breathe, they absorb pollutants, Trees can remove up to 60% of street level air pollute, pollution, that's gas and small particulate matter, and they produce oxygen. They also create feelings of relaxation and well being. Uh, trees have been shown to create healthy environments for people by improving the air and reducing heat island effects. And in New York City, they saw a decrease of almost 30% of asthma in young children after increasing its tree canopy through the installation of over 300 trees per square kilometer. Studies have also shown that individuals that use or access to green space tend to be healthier. Employees experience 23% less sick time and have greater job satisfaction if they have trees near their place of work. Hospital re patients recover faster with fewer drugs. And trees have also been shown to have a calming and healing effect on ADHD adults and teens. Trees just because they're out there encourage physical activity and provide a connection with nature and encourage outdoor activities. So when urban forests and trees are part of short and long-term planning, cities can realize um, a decrease impact of non-communicable chronic diseases like obesity, asthma, and mental health disorders and create the next generation of environmental stewards and a beautiful city. The research does show that trees support quality of life and neighborhood revitalization. Because trees are you know, a key component of neighborhoods, they absorb noise and dust and they provide shade and they lower ambient temperatures. Um, and, the, and that's all things that make a neighborhood and are, play into quality of life. And conventional wisdom has it that trees and vegetation probably have a negative impact on crime due to the cover it provides criminal activities. However, recent studies have shown that tree-lined streets have actually been linked to lower crime. There was a study in Baltimore that found a 10% increase in tree canopy 
was associated with a roughly 12% decrease in crime. So yeah, while low and dense brush may be associated with crime, tall broad canopies were actually associated with a decrease in crime. And additionally, outdoor areas with trees tend to suffer less from graffiti, vandalism, and littering than, their, than treeless areas. Tree-lined streets create stronger neighborhoods and attract new residents. And one study showed that residents of apartment buildings surrounded by trees reported knowing their neighbors better, socializing with them more often, having a stronger community, and feeling safer and better adjusted than, um, than did residents of more barren but otherwise identical areas. Research has also um, shown that trees support community walkability. And in an age where walkability and pedestrian-friendly areas tend to draw the most people, tree cover is a powerful tool in revitalizing districts and neighborhoods. Urban trees have been shown to slow traffic and help ensure safe, walkable streets and communities. Traffic speeds and driver stress levels have been reported to be lower on tree-lined streets contributing to a reduction in road rage and aggressive driving. The buffers between walking areas and driving lanes created by trees also make it feel safer. So trees growing between streets and sidewalks enclose a street space and calming traffic. And they also provide pedestrians with a buffer from traffic and protection from the weather, making pedestrians and cyclists feel safer and even better about walking. Tree canopy is critical to age-friendly communities. Ample street trees and shaded resting areas encourage active communi community participation, which can result in healthier living for all generations. There was a five-year study of seniors in Japan that found that having readily available space for taking walks and the presence of parks and tree-lined streets near their residences were significant predictors of higher survival rates regardless of their age, sex, marital sta status, baseline functional status, and their socioeconomic status. It was just the trees that made them live longer. Trees contribute greatly to the success of business districts. And despite the common perception among business owners that trees hide business signages, signage, studies have shown that tree-covered commercial shopping districts are more successful than those without canopy. In multiple studies, consumers showed a willingness to pay 11% more for goods, and they shopped for longer periods of time in shaded and landscape business districts. Consumers even felt that the quality of the products were better in business districts surrounded by trees. Due to the urban heat island effect, built up urban areas without trees often experience temperatures 15 to 25 degrees hotter than nearby less developed areas. And heat stress has been proven to cause significant public health problems and even mortality. In fact, every year more Americans die from extreme heat than all other natural disasters combined. That's hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, and lightning. And those over 65, age 65 or under the age of five are especially vulnerable to heat-related health problems. So the science is rife with data about tree benefits for stormwater management and the huge variety of co-benefits. So now what we need to do is practice what we preach. And I know this is not breaking news, but agencies across the country have used trees in a variety of green infrastructure projects. And the benefits of doing so are gaining ground. So next, I want to briefly show you some examples of some tree-centric stormwater solutions and case studies that hopefully resonate with you as planners. And I think some of them may even surprise you. So if you've ever been to Cincinnati or just passed through it on the way to Florida, like many people do, then you might be interested in this green infrastructure project. This area was a typical, is a typical interstate right-of-way. You know, it has crappy soil, impervious road surfaces, and steep topography. And all the storm water from this watershed goes right into the Ohio River. So Sanitation District Number 1 of Northern Kentucky is the controlling regional stormwater and sewer authority. And they had their hands full with this little management area. It's Willow Run, and its CSO annual volume is over 5 million gallons. And it 
that it accounts for 29% of the total overflows in the whole management district for SD1. So they needed to have a creative um, project and solution to this. So being proactive and an early adopter of green infrastructure solutions in the Northern Kentucky area, Sanitation District Number 1 and their consultants designed an extensive stormwater management project where trees were critical were a critical element. The project, what, they, what it did was created a series of berms and trenches supplemented with engineered soils and native trees on that steep hillside adjacent to the interstate right-of-way. At the completion of the project, eight acres of trees stand where there used to only be grass and eroded hillsides. The difference in the land cover is dramatic. This, this is after, and this is, whoops, I'm sorry. That was before, and you can see there wasn't much um, greenery. And afterwards, the eight acres now takes up most of that hillside. And this highly visible project is still functioning and going strong today. Here's another case study in Cincinnati. It is where I'm from, so I'm giving you these. The uh, Lick Run watershed covers about 3,000 acres on Cincinnati's west side, and every year about half a billion gallons of sewage mixed with stormwater overflow from this watershed and go right into the Mill Creek, which goes into the Ohio. So the Lick Run project, which is currently under construction, is planned, and it is truly a green infrastructure pro project with trees all through it. it is supposed to to eliminate nearly 400 million gallons of CSOs annually and ensure 88% of the flows during a typical year of rain reach the Mill Creek treatment plant or is discharged as cleaner stormwater. So the focus of this project is to keep stormwater out of the combined sewer system through a variety of gray and green infrastructure projects across the watershed. So that includes not only new sewers, but these sewers are complemented with bioswales, stream restoration, stormwater detention basins, bioinfiltration uh, gardens, and the creation of a mile-long constructed waterway that is supposed to mimic a natural stream. The project also understands and will uh, harness the power of trees as co-benefits. In this, they're going to provide a lot of environmental and public health benefits that we've already talked about, economic benefits, and the social benefits. And the social benefits are can be intangible, but equally as important as all the quantifiable economic benefits. This is going to encourage more people to use have recreational use of the waterways. It's going to enhance natural habitats for people, plants, and wildlife, and it's going to improve the aesthetic appeal of creeks and streams. So in the end, this green infrastructure project and its tree components will really help facilitate urban renewal and community development and control stormwater and improve water quality. If you want more information about using trees and stormwater projects, particularly for redevelopment projects in dense urban areas, I want to remind you or at least or maybe make you aware of this EPA publication that's, that is in the resource library. It has examples of techniques to accommodate development and trees, and it's chock full of case studies. I guess my point is that if you want to know more, or if you want to influence people you work with, then there are many educational resources in the guide, as well as real world, local and regional examples of, this, of successful projects, initiatives, and regulations that incorporate trees into stormwater management projects. As I hinted at earlier, you can harness the power of trees for your green infrastructure goals without lifting a shovel. One way is to create or strengthen your tree ordinances and zoning codes, like Pittsburgh did. Pittsburgh's Public Works Department and Planning Department are presenting City Council with a revised tree ordinance and updated land development regulation where stormwater management is an express goal. Pittsburgh is codifying their a minimum urban tree canopy percentages per land use since they know existing mature trees are already providing valuable green infrastructure services and benefits that will take years to replace if trees are allowed to be removed during land development. Setting minimum canopy standards per land use has been adopted and enforced by Fairfax County, Virginia, Arlington, Virginia, Prince George County, Maryland, Fort Worth, Texas, 
Mooresville, North Carolina, and even counties in Georgia. So the precedent has been set. All you have to do is follow suit. Are trees going to solve any of these issues by themselves? Well, no, for the most part, no. But if they aren't considered and incorporated into city planning and protected, our cities will lose large amounts of canopy quickly and not be able to recover for over 50 years. And large losses of trees raise other utility costs exponentially. These losses cannot be quickly rebuilt with either gray or green solutions. No one likes more regulations, but tree ordinances, stormwater ordinances, and zoning regulations that protect existing canopy cover are critical to ensuring trees are given the chance to help mitigate stormwater and provide all the great co-benefits and make our communities more sustainable. And that's primarily because size matters. The bigger the tree, the more bang you're going to get in, with your stormwater and green infrastructure dollar. Here's a case study that recognized that size matters and did something about it. Uh, in Northern Kentucky, the Planning and Development Services is the planning agency for two counties and many municipalities. And they recognized the power of trees for stormwater management and undertook a proactive project to identify areas where existing trees were providing the most stormwater benefits. With this information, they thought land development projects and the effects on trees and stormwater could be evaluated more quickly and easily. The um, cl classification system for this was a pretty simple GIS project that looked at these factors, forest cover, floodplains, steep slopes, riparian corridor, impervious surface, and runoff potential. And so what resulted after this GIS pro um, effort was this map. And it's a GIS layer that can be used to inform and guide land development in the watersheds. So trees and forests can now be part of the discussion right from the start of any land development project. In effect, all forest land provides benefits, but of the total forest cover in this particular watershed, um, Planning and Development Services now knows that 15% are providing the most benefit. So when planning roads, utility corridor expansions, and new commercial and residential development, everyone knows which areas to avoid. Urban forest master plans and management plans are critical. Whether it's a section or an addendum to your comp plan or a standalone plan, urban forest management plans specifically look at the natural resources that the community has and provide professional, a professional roadmap for preserving and enhancing the urban tree canopy. Examples of these kind of documents and plans are also in the, the guide. So just to summarize, why should trees be in your planning toolbox? Because I like to think of them as the Swiss Army knife of a community's natural resource. No other tool is so versatile, which means we can use trees to mitigate or solve a wide variety of ur urban and community uh, problems and achieve many community goals. So why plan for a project that only has one benefit when you can use trees and get many benefits? That's the question that I hear. So I think this guide will help you Understand that and win that battle if that's what you're facing and can help you unmuddy the waters through education. And, you know, I, get, I am a forester and an arborist and I could be biased, but I really do encourage you to make trees part of your plan because they really make the biggest difference in the quality of life for our communities. And here's who we are and how you contact us. And now I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, we still have a few minutes for questions. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please do so by selecting the raise your hand button on your control panel, panel or by typing a question into the questions box. Anna, this is Travis. I know we had a few questions coming in as we were going through, just to maybe hit those real quick. Um, one of the questions was, where is the guide located? So treesandstormwater.org uh, is the uh, is the location. Uh, we, we, 
Thanks, Travis. We just uh, got one question. Um, are there are there particular species of trees that are best for capturing stormwater? Anybody want to answer that? I'm sure. It depends on yeah, I I can. Um, there certainly are, uh, and typically that's the large canopy trees that whatever grows in your region. And I want to point you to iTree Tools. Um, I, somebody asked that question. We've mentioned iTree. So it's itreetools.org. There is an application called iTree Species. So it's super easy to use. You go in, you put your zip code in, and then you tell it what benefit you want. So is it, is it air pollution? But there's a storm water. And then based on your climactic region, it will generate a top 20 list of the species that would give you the most stormwater benefit for your region. Um, but if you can just think in your region for the large canopy trees, that's the ones you should use and plant. Uh, this is David, I, and thanks, Jenny. I wanted to follow up on that. I saw several questions about iTree. So that is a great tool, iTree Tools. And one of the things you can do on it is actually for any tree, you can generate, I showed a slide of lifetime benefits, which were stormwater and many other things, but you can calculate the stormwater benefits that are provided by any particular tree, even one in your backyard. It's iTree Landscape, I believe, is one of the applications. So it's a really neat tool to play around with. And I also wanted to mention someone, I think, asked whether I AICT credits would be requested for this uh, for this webinar, and the answer is yes. We will we will uh, we will follow up on that. Okay, we had uh, thanks, David. We we had a few other questions come in. Um, I'll start with the first one. Ever encounter concern from uh, traffic engineers toward putting trees in the right of way? Um, we had one of the one of these in Minneapolis when uh, trying to put in planted tra neighborhood traffic circles. Uh, resistance was from um, the Federal Highway Administration. I can chime in on that one, um, and I you know, short answer is yes. You know, and I think that's where it comes to to communication and and understanding what all the benefits are. Uh, of trees, obviously in right-of-way situations, safety is the, is the concern. So it comes back to design, making sure that the trees aren't blocking views um, at, at critical intersections, making sure that they're far enough from the, uh, the edge of pavement, that if a car goes astray or awry, uh, that it's not uh, putting imminent danger to, uh, to motorists. Uh, situation here in Ohio, um, you know, working closely with the Department of Transportation on a, an interchange design, uh, we were pleased to uh, to be able to put trees a little closer uh, to the road than than typical because of the the design and location of the guardrail. Uh, so the you know the guardrail was able to mitigate safety and uh, and the department was uh, was open to having vegetation planted closer uh, and being able to fill more of the right of way. So I think uh, to answer David Peterson's question, it, you know it comes to creativity. It comes to you know. Um, it comes to being able to, to have an open dialogue with uh, all the stakeholders involved in projects like that, and uh, and hopefully this guide will help uh, and in those conversations and causing people to think more openly and, and maybe think differently uh, about design solutions. Hopefully that helps. Thanks, Travis. Um, another question, uh, are there better trees to plant where the sidewalks are located, um, like long-term sidewalk maintenance? Uh, regarding uh, long-term sidewalk maintenance and routes. Well, yeah, there are there are some trees that have less aggressive root systems, but it really boils down to the right tree in the right place. So you, you have to look at the site and see how much space do I have. And if it's a small space, you really need to plant a small tree. Um, all trees will help with the stormwater, but if there are sidewalk issues. Uh, you really need to work with an urban forester and um, find out those species that would will function and still allow the um, sidewalk and other hardscape to be uh, undamaged. Thanks, Jenny. Um, in communities with expanses of heavily treed areas, do you recommend a forestry management or tree harvesting program? If they have like natural forests, 
Um, I, I absolutely promote uh, doing a forest management plan. Traditional foresters, de state departments of, de of, of forestry, divisions of forestry can help cities with that um, and communities or counties. But a forest management plan is, is critical and sometimes forest management means r removing trees to encourage you know other tree species or get out invasives so sometimes tree removal is part of the whole management strategy but protecting intact forest tracts of land is a huge thing for stormwater management thanks jenny uh we had another question um i think this one's really important uh it's relevant to where I live in Fairfax County. Um, what is the most effective way to deter the removal of adult or mature trees? Um, we've had numerous land clearings in hope of selling properties. Uh, remo removal of tree uh, trees due to damage to sidewalks, as well as removal to protect electric cable uh, or cable lines. Well, that all goes back to the regulations and ordinances and you know the zoning code you have to just get tough and if the community supports that if there's enough political will to say hey this is this is what we value in our community we need a canopy we want our trees and there better be a dang good reason why a mature tree is coming down um, meaning you have to go through a permit process or certain qualifications have to happen that's that's really the only way to, to do it. Um, you come at the soft side of it and just do a lot of marketing and public relations and education about the value of these trees. But sometimes it does come down to regulations. Yeah, yeah if and I could just, uh, could I just, excuse me, build on that for a second? Because I want to point out the city of Atlanta, which calls itself the city of trees. It values its trees. And it has some of the strictest tree regulations I've seen in any city in the country. Basically, a homeowner has to get a permit to cut down a tree on his, prop on his or her property above a certain size. So, so that's an example, and there are other models out there as well. Thank you, guys. Um, we have a few other questions. I'll try to get to maybe one or maybe one or two more. Um, do the I tree tools and other tools? Uh, do the eye tree tools cover tree disease? Not really. Um, there w they were creating a database for, for symptoms to help identify, you know, infestations, but that's not really for um, a reference or for the lay people. It's more for research. So no, um, best bet is to go to. Uh, the Division of Forestry or county extension agencies and um, hook up with them to see what's what's happening, what's on the forefront, and what's threatening the tree population in your community. Thanks, Thanks Jenny. Um, so we have two more. Um, what's the best option for gr uh, ground cover along with these uh, with along with these trees? Not grass. Anything but grass. Uh, trees and grass don't get along. Um, they're mutually exclusive. So any herbaceous ground cover, I mean, I, I, like ivy. I mean, I know ivy climbs up trees. We don't want that. But you know, hostas, ivies, um, anything that is not a grass uh, is a great ground cover uh, under trees. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, last question. Um, can you address some of the literature that states urban street trees trap pollutants near ground level? I'm sorry, can I cite the literature? Is that uh, it says, can you address some of the literature? I guess maybe um, get uh, point, point to any literature that states urban street trees trap pollutants near ground level. Near ground level pollutants. I guess I I'll, may take a stab at that. Um, my first first reaction to the question would be to point to um, all of the other co-benefits associated with trees. Um, but, but secondly, I think you need to, particularly with shade trees and large canopy trees, uh, it's reducing the air temperature. Um, so when it comes to uh, some of the, you know, the, the um, emissions, you know, coming off of roads, coming out of vehicles along those roads, um, you know, by reducing the temperatures in that environment, you're, you're helping 
the situation. Uh, so even if it's slowing the dissipation of that down slightly and very slightly, um, you're still improving the situation, I would suspect, uh, just based on the, the temperature reduction. So that would be my knee-jerk reaction to the question. It's a good question. Um, you know, and that's something that's an area that there's, you know, going to continue to be research and, and science developed on. But Yeah, I, maybe I could add on to that. I think the Forest Service has done uh, some research on that, so I can't cite any specific studies. I'd look at their work, but I do know that uh, trees can also be a source of VOCs, volatile organic compounds, if I'm not mistaken, some species more than another. So it's kind of a two-way street. So. Uh, it, it, I think the science is quite complex, but I, I, I'd look at the Forest Service to see what uh, what kind of research they have available. Um, and I do believe there was actually a question earlier. Um, the the trees and stormwater uh, website is still in beta mode. I think Travis wanted to speak to that a little bit. Just real quickly, when you visit it, you'll see the beta, um, and that's through the end of the calendar year. Uh, so the point is, and the point to the audience as you visit it, uh, if you have a comment, suggestion on how to improve the site, um, you know, maybe resources that aren't there that should be, or things of that nature, let us know. Reach out, let us know it is in beta, uh, at least for the next six weeks, and you know we're actively polishing the site, um, continuing to, to add. Uh, to it. So if you have a, a thought or idea, suggestion, criticism, uh, we're still open. There's still time. So thanks, Anna. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. And thank you, David, Travis, and Jenny for speaking with us today. As a reminder, you're going to receive an email within the next 24 hours. There will be a link to the video um, with the presentation and other resources. Um, if for some reason you did have any audio trouble, you will be able to hear it then um, if you want to replay it, the video in that. Um, thank you again for your attendance and we look forward to your participation on other webinars. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.